Now, I, I actually, um, I want to have um, Peter, I want you to present now because you'll really make us hungry by what you're going to talk about. Um, Peter and I have been um, friends and uh, colleagues for uh, 20 plus years. He's a fascinating on entrepreneur. As many of you know, I have this kind of theory that there's entrepreneurs have a, um, a kind of a thesis and an extension to it. You know, they do the same thing, but they iterate around a thesis. And Peter really defies that whole theory because he's done so many different things so well. He's been in telecoms. He's running a stock brokering uh, business. He'll tell you a little bit more about his background. He's lots of patents. He's been an innovator, and he's operated in many, many different markets. Um, when he called me up earlier this year, I remember where I was sitting. I was in my Zurich office, and uh, and and I, I remember hearing ecosystem fish. And I kind of thought, hmm, hmm, you know. And then um, he 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 came to uh, FTE and Sam Moritz, and I thought, you know, wow, that's really powerful. Taking and applying all of his technology knowledge to the world of fresh fish. So it's a fascinating um, business that you're bringing to life, Peter. Thank you so much for coming back. Would you please welcome Peter Karsten? Thank you, everyone. So let's see. Whoa, we have one of these things. Wonderful, it works. Miraculous. Okay, clean food. We can break that down, and instead we can talk about fresh, local, and sustainable. We can break that down, and suddenly we have very many things to think about. And I don't want to do that. I'd like to focus on the things that we need to discuss today. So what I'd like to do is first say a couple of words about what we're trying to do, and then from that go into the broader context of how that fits into the overall picture, and then go from that into the meaning of sustainable in food, and then into what we're trying to do. So that, those are kind of, kind of the steps I'd like to go through. We intend to, as you can read yourselves, use machine learning, computer vision, machine vision, radar, use artificial intelligence in order to produce fish incredibly efficiently. And we in, intend to put many sites across the world that do that, close to customers. That's what we intend to do. So how did we stumble on this? Well, we went around and had a look around. Um, the dominant suppliers of farmed fish today are up the road from us in Norway. Uh, so both Henry and I are from up north, from Finland. That's where they build the fish. They do it offshore like this, in their fjords, protected nicely. They also do it in Chile. Chile is huge in the same way. And in the Nordic region, they've started taking those things on land. So they've built a number of so-called RAS farms, recirculating aquaculture system. Okay, fine, so it's land-based fish farming. But the people that have done it, all of them that we've visited, and we've visited many, this is one. So all the white guys here, these guys here, are all breathing fish people. All of them have the same mindset. So they see themselves as farmers, they identify as farmers, and they try to get to profit as quickly as they possibly can do. Now, we all recognize that that can make sense. But they do it at the expense of thinking through the technology behind it. So they've licensed the same software that people use for sea-based farming and stuck it on land. Now, when you farm fish in the sea, um, there are lots of assumptions that you can just sort of assume. And there's oxygenation levels, uh, pH levels, temperatures, light, etc., etc., sulfides, phosphates, all those things you can just assume because Mother Nature takes care of them. When you close the system, when you take everything on land and you control everything, then you take on a responsibility. And that's where people are failing up north, and that's where I see our angle. So we will start everything from artificial intelligence. Like Henry likes to say, if you can't measure it, it's not going in my factory. So we're going to take the same type of approach that we see in North America today when it comes to beef farming, when it comes to grain farming. Very, very numeric. And we don't see it in fish farming yet. So we take that type of yield thinking into fish farming. 
That's what we're going to do. And that is, believe it or not, in its simplicity, a huge change in the way that fish is farmed. So where are the major markets? Well, the um, main suppliers, like I said before, are to some extent New Zealand, if you wish, but it's really Chile and Norway that are the two big ones. So that's where all the salmon is built today. However, the consumption is in the middle bit. It's around the equator, plus or minus 30 degrees. Five billion people out of eight billion people approximately on the planet today live plus or minus 30 degrees from the equator. That's where I do all my work right now. And that's our main market. What we want to do is to put fish factories next to the main cities in that area so that we can provide fresh fish instead of having frozen fish which is two weeks old coming out of Norway. We want to provide fish that was caught less than 24 hours ago. Very different product. Very different product. And you can provide the distribution of that fresh fish in a wide area? Uh, we intend to have multiple factories. Multiple factories. So uh, 3.1 million metric tons is a fairly big number. Um, and um, each one of our factories will produce about 500 tons per month. So that's not very much relative to the 3.1 million number. So we are going to put lots of little factories around there. Maybe we will have some transport. If some people want to pay a spot price at a high price, maybe we do that. But I think most of it is actually going to be delivered locally. So outside Athens, put a factory within three, four hours from here so that we can um, do all the uh, gutting and cleaning of the fish overnight, deliver at six in the morning, which means that people can pick up a fish in the morning and say, oh, caught today, this morning. How about that? Instead of having a, a, a date which says, to eat this before July or, or you'll die, we'll tell people that we caught it today. And by the way, you can eat it by July, but why not eat it today because it's fresh? That's quite a different value proposition. Sorry? Yes and no, to be really precise, um, because in the um, first markets that we've been talking to, um, some of our clients say that they do their logistics, they don't want us to do any of it, they just want head on gutted fish, HOG fish, hog fish, um, and they come pick up, they do all the packaging, everything. And some of the other clients that we've spoken to have said that actually what we'd prefer would be that you do all the packaging and so forth and so forth, and you deliver direct to our shops. Okay, I don't have the answer really to how we're going to do it, and, but I'm sure that it will be multiple things. So that's kind of a quick overview. So what is this situation? Well, it's important that unlike AI, um, Global warming is something which is mutually understood worldwide as being a problem. Hottest ever. We've never had this situation before. All in all, things are going in the right direction. Everyone's getting richer. So by 2030, according to the United Nations, the uh, GDP per capita is going to be $14,000 uh, worldwide. That's an incredibly high number, in my opinion. And very, very unevenly distributed. But even so, it's a really good number. So we're going in the right direction. According to the United Nations, the newly rich countries don't really care um, about um, uh, a lot of things. That they'll just do it their way. Uh, I've just spent the last three weeks in India, in Bhubaneswar. That's 10 million people. Chennai, 12 million people. Bangalore, including the suburbs, 12 million people. I've been to Pune, Mumbai, Delhi, Hyderabad over the last uh, three weeks. All of those cities are 10 plus. If you take with the suburbs, maybe 20 plus million people each. So the big, big factories. And really, um, we're not going to be, <laughs> we're not in a position to go and tell them anything. They'll just do their thing. So uh, India is a bad example for beef, um, but. Um, uh, uh, beef consumption is going up. And are we all making sense? Well, just go to Dubai. I live in Dubai right now. 
and look at architecture. You and I touched on this the other day. Um, all these fancy buildings in Dubai, and I live in one, um, all glass, 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 four sides. Okay, great. Really clever. Looks like San Francisco. I love it. But unbelievably stupid. And instead of capturing some fragments of the good things that we've done in the past, we're just erasing it. So we're building greenhouses. So the way that, or if you look at traditional architecture here or in uh, the Cairo, you don't put windows south facing. I mean, come on. But um, these houses have windows in all four directions. You put the curtains on the inside. And once you put the curtains on the inside, you caught in all, all the energy. All that uh, curtains are getting super hot. And then you pay for Mitsubishi and Panasonic air conditioning systems to, to go fix it. How friendly stupid, I, I apologize for using the F word, how friendly stupid is that? It is unbelievable. But that's what we do. And for that reason, beef consumption is going up. We're also eating 12 crops, so nearly all the food we eat today is, can be summarized into 12 crops and five species. So in terms of diversity, we're gambling heavily. So food will be a problem. Hunger will return. If you read the United Nations papers on these things, hunger will return. We will have famine in the next 10 to 15 years, 20 years. It will happen. We will mess things up. That's what's going to happen. And our production is uncorrelated to these shortages that will come. We will have droughts and so forth. Our machine will keep going. So in terms of our business model and so forth, well, um, if, we may, if we get $6 per kilogram for our salmon, then we're profitable. Not by much, but we're profitable. And that's the FOB price in Norway. So free on board in, in Norway, $6. So we can operate at $6, nice. Landed cost $11 in most of these markets for frozen salmon. If we can make $11, we're giggling. That's a lot of money for us. We're making a lot of profit at that level. But we're delivering not frozen fish from last week. We're delivering fresh fish. So maybe there's even room for an upside. But let's not go dream too much because a lot of people are very cost conscious. So let's see. Um, but in any case, uh, the business case seems to work. And the spot market effect is strong. So um, there's more supply, there's less supply. The alternative products that people can eat are more or less abundant and so forth. So by simply running, as long as we have a steady state where we're nice and profitable, when these shortages come along, a lot of money to be made. So let's also let's look at this in a broader context again. So some of the things we are doing as a species um, are somewhat clever. Um, we have, over the, over the last 20 years, switched to eat more fish than beef. That's a change. So that's a move in the right direction. So we're do, doing a couple of things that do make some sense. We can't go fishing much more um, because we've pretty much emptied out the seas. So the, the scope for increasing fishing in open oceans, yes, we can do a little bit. But relative to the population increase that we're going to, um, we can't. So we're stretching out our lives. We're moving from 8 billion to by the year 2100, there will be 12 billion of us. That's too much protein, we can't do it. According to the United Nations, there's going to be a protein shortage at the end of this decade. So, um, so somehow, 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 that needs to be fixed. Lab grown, yep, very possible. But like I say, food is emotional. Um, when you do lab-grown meat, what you do is you get involved when, when the cow gives birth, you get involved and you extract some fetal um, bovine serum um, in order to do your lab-grown meat with today's technology. Okay? In the future that will be different, but right now that's what you do. And that serum is of very uneven quality and so forth. You can't scale it um, with today's technology. And hopefully that will be different in the future, but not today. Um, and from an emotional standpoint, as a marketing thing, that's, like, hmm, that's not nice, it's kind of yucky. Um, insects, seaweeds, fabulous. Super good ways of building protein. But it's an engineer's solution to the problem because um, if I live in Bangalore, then I, I want really good sheep and so forth. I want, I want a good lamb, you know. 
It, it, it's, don't come and tell me to eat grasshoppers. Uh, it's, it's an identity question. It's emotional and cultural. So I'm impressed by uh, the way that um, Bill and Melinda are investing in, in this, and Kleiner Perkins and so forth. They're, they're being very brave, but um, it, it smells to me as though a lot of these investments here in the insects and seaweeds, uh, they're kind of for people in this room, um, as opposed to being for the guys that live out there. Um, because it's a hard sell if you're trying to explain to people that should, they should eat seaweed. It's a difficult thing to do. So that's kind of that, the way that looks. One thing, though, that's very important is to understand that if you have 100 kilograms of feed and you want to turn that feed into protein, then where is it efficient to do it? And there you have big differences. So for the same 100 kilogram, you get this much salmon and this much chicken and this much pork and beef. So um, that feed conversion ratio, FCR, is a key parameter. And salmon kicks in that situation. It's very, very good. So, so that makes sense. OK, so that's kind of fitting that into the overall war, world. And then we have this thing. OK, so carbon dioxide. Um, well, relative to most of the other things that we're competing with, um, carbon dioxide on salmon farming, depending on whom you believe, is a low thing. It's, it's very efficient in that sense. So that's kind of good. Um, and it becomes more relevant when you um, put it in context. So we have all the greenhouse gases over here. Um, most of the greenhouse gas problems that we have are carbon dioxide related, which comes down to fossil fuels. Um, okay, so carbon, and I'm measuring this in radiative forcing, which is a, a good way of comparing carbon dioxide with methane. Methane is a problem, some others as well. Methane is a major problem, and essentially methane, most of methane comes from big carbohydrate chains that don't break down all the way down to carbon dioxide water because there's not enough oxygen, so it, it stops at CH4 instead of going to CO2. Um, and um, so agriculture is the main problem there. Energy production is huge for methane, which means that um, when you drill up oil and so forth, you let methane go, and then waste management. We waste 30% of all the food we eat. Out of the, um, if you look at the rich countries, China, Europe, and the North American part, then 30% of the food that's delivered in our homes is something that we put in the bin. And um, that's a major contributor to that one. That's how clever we are. So we're not smart. We're behaving in a really stupid manner. If you break down the agriculture part, then um, food in the tummies of cows, um, gas out front and bottom, and then manure management, same thing. So with manure, um, you have manure, and then you have um, anaerobic uh, breakdown, and boom, you get methane coming out, so those things. Rice cultivation is a big bandit for methane as well because it's grown underwater largely, not enough oxygen, boom, you get methane. So those are some main challenges. The reason I say those things is because it's, people get it. I mean, the, if you look at the OECD and the United Nations Global Compact, they get it. They understand that this is a problem. At the moment, the target is that we'll only have plus three degrees of temperature rise during this uh, century. I don't understand how it can stop at three degrees. How about 12? I just don't get it. Because if you take an apple and you look at the skin of an apple, then the skin of our, uh, our atmosphere is one-tenth of the thickness of the skin of the apple. So it's totally within our power to ruin it. And so far, all I've seen is evidence that we don't know how to control ourselves. I'm not impressed. So, um, so, so, but these guys do get it. Um, so there's real money involved in this. Now, we're young. We're, we're not in a position where we can go and ask for sustainability-linked debt or use of proceeds debt. We're not there. We can't get debt yet. We can get grants, and they're country-based, these grants. I'll talk about these grants in a moment. And there's real money behind this, and the structure that's used for this stuff is that the big guys, so the IMF and so forth, they're putting proper money as securities for big loans and big 
grants under these programs. So this is real proper money. I'm impressed by this. This is, a, this is actually really, really good. So contrary to some of my comments previously, this is good. Um, and the way they do it is very simple. Um, you get a bank that makes a big, big loan, and then people like the IMF take the lowest part of the hierarchy. And if the company goes bust, the IMF takes a haircut, but the banks get their ball back. Good. This is a really good structure. The little one here, this one is 10 times bigger than that one. Um, the little one here uh, is based on KPIs, and Eco Plaza in Holland is a good example. Um, what they've done is they've said, look, you lend us very much money, and we will use that money to open up a whole bunch of new stores all over the place. Good. And we promise that the percentage of goods that we waste will go down according to this profile. If we hit our KPIs for reducing waste in our operations, our loan is interest-free. If we fail to hit our KPIs, we pay a high interest. That's the deal. Very good. So this is KPI-based. So this side here is totally KPI-based. Whereas this side here is different. Um, the one that's 10 times bigger means that you claim that your company fundamentally is green. We're too small to ask for this money yet, but we will be in a position to ask for this in the future. So, great. So my company builds batteries, or my f a company on the social side helps children get educated or something like that. And based on that, boom, I get funded because fundamentally I'm ESG. So that's a different way of doing it. And then grants, like I said, they're, they're country by country basis. So that's the way that works. You ask for money based on environmental or social, and then they check that you're not going to just burn the money by checking your governance, so ESG. Um, cool. So our business then is AI-controlled salmon, which means that we're going to build one central control center and many unintelligent local places where we roll out, roll out, roll out, roll out, where we have lots of sensors with all this capability, and we put this next to these cities. That's what our business is all about. And um, the structure that we're doing is that the holding company at the moment is in Singapore, and we put IP and data operations there. We've identified our first location for deployment, and we've done that opportunistically. So we've been around to a whole bunch of cities to see what the deal is, if there's something that we can do. And we found that Korea, South Korea, happens to be a place which um, really wants us to come there. They currently, they're, together with Japan, they're the biggest f uh, fish con or seafood um, consumers in the world. They currently buy their fish from Russia and China. And for some reason, they'd quite like to be self-sufficient instead of being dependent on those two. And they're pre pre prepared to pay money for that. Good. Perfect. So we can help. So, so South Korea will be the first deployment. Next one after that, don't know. I've spoken to a number of people. Um, Hyderabad in India, very interested. Um, Oman, interested. Um, there are many interested. I think Montevideo, Rio de Janeiro would, would be good too. Let's see. Let's see. We'll, we'll see. We'll treat that opportunistically. So we need like a SWAT team that we're building up here in the Singapore team to go around and work out what, which deals make the most, most sense for us. And we'll play it opportunistically on that basis. Peter, we've got 10 yep. minutes. 10 minutes. Yep. Okay. I'm nearly done. Okay. Um, so what is the structure right now? Well, um, we've signed an MOU in um, South Korea, in the Republic of Korea, um, with politicians there, whereby the MOU states that they will pay for 50% of all our operating costs in order to make this happen. In practice, verbally, they've said that they will pay more. Do I believe them? Well, actually, yes, because I'm aware of one other company that's received 92% of total funding. They make a different product, but they're in the same space. But they promised 50%. So that's nice. So that's good. So the way that we're doing this is that, okay, so we have the Singapore holding company, 
So people like Henry and I will sit in the Singapore holding company. And I will also be the um, CEO for the um, local company. So we have Breathing Fish SK down here. This has been formed already. We already have this office, so that already exists. Each unit costs about $60 million to build. So it's proper money. Out of that, okay, 30 million by the Korean government, good. And out of that, as an infrastructure investment, 30 million from local investors. And the reason we're here now, Henry and I, is because we have two needs, actually three needs to be precise. One is that these things are only unlocked if we can show that we have external financing from some European or some American outfit um, who put in somewhere between 500,000 and a million dollars into the mothership. And they don't accept my money. They want some external validation that we're making sense. So that's the one thing. The next thing is that, hey, um, making this bigger in Korea, absolutely, makes sense. We can make it four times that size. With this money, we will take roughly an 8 to 10% market share in salmon. Of course, there are other types of fish. But even if we just focus on salmon, instead of 8 to 10%, we could be targeting 30%. So there's scope for us to expand inside just Korea. There's room. Um, and furthermore, um, if we go into this global expansion, um, when I was even younger and even more innocent, I was at Nokia, and one of the things that we did was to roll out multiple telecom networks, and when you do that quickly, you have some financing models. We had, for instance, Citibank as one of our partners so that we could do various f formats and so forth. So we do need, longer term, we do need a financial partner so that we have a default friend that we can turn to when we want to enter new, new countries. So those are kind of three different things. So, um, so one thing is the holding company, the mothership. One thing is um, expanding the local operation in Korea. And the third thing is um, this cookie cutter scenario. And we definitely want to go, go there. That is the end of my presentation. Well, that's fantastic. And it's super, it's great to hear it because each time I, I hear you speak, I, I learn a little bit more about that. But thank you very much. Questions for Peter? Yes, please, Giovanni. Help reconcile the FDA and other governing bodies that mandate that fish be flash frozen and then delivered, as you made reference to, and then the benefit of delivering fresh fish, and what if three or four days pass without delivery of said fresh fish? Is there a governmental imposition of, now you have to freeze it? Um, let's be precise. Please. Yes and no. <laughs> and um, so, um, uh, if we look at the first market, Korea, right. Um, uh, they don't want to write their own rules. They've made that statement. So what they do instead is they, as far as possible, try to follow the UN, which in practice means following the US. So they trail the US um, at FAO by a couple of years, and they pretty much try to, try to copy that. That's pretty much what's going on, and that's good. That's fine. Um, and there are many rules, um, there are, and those rules are in our favor because they build barriers to entry, so we like rules. Um, so, um, yes, there are rules on that. Uh, the, uh, supply, the companies that we want to supply to in South Korea are about 12 companies in total. So there's a diversity there. Um, and they want to have product on their shelves all the time. Good. We like to supply things evenly. Um, we can gut a little bit faster or a bit slower. We can do those things, but we prefer to just run it as process. Um, and um, th there are several r rules around this. Another rule is that uh, uh, the fish should be happy. Uh, so um, we, need, uh, we need to look at how many kilograms of fish we have per cubic meter, for instance. That's one of the parameters that they follow. And their target is currently 15 to 45 kilograms of fish per cubic meter. 
we're modeling on 15 kilograms of fish per cubic meter because we're assuming that that's where the whole thing will go. So there will be more and more rules coming in. Good. Um, we look forward to those being imposed on everyone. And of course, mm -hmm. given that we're totally numerically controlled, it's easier for us to manage rules. It's, uh, it's a ru in, the, in the standards war, rules are in our favor. So we like that. Excellent. Listen, uh, Thank we, you. we're going to make you the, um, the swarm around you at lunch, but we're going to break for lunch today. Um, people are fascinated by the, by the vision and uh, want to make it happen. So we're going to look for ways of helping you open markets, uh, bringing, bringing capital to it. And, uh, and we know you're going to be very successful. Thank you, Peter, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um,